Hello, welcome back. Uh, when last we left off, we had just been defeated. Uh, Chris Benoit tricked us into a handicap match against the APA. And now it is time for us to get our revenge. As we start Chapter 6 in Kurt Angle's quest to become the Intercontinental Champion. And it's payback time. <laughs> so we go to hire the APA, but Bradshaw is at the pool hall. And now we, we see the money that we've accumulated actually comes into play here. <laughs> As we, we pay Farouk 300 of the dollars we've earned chasing down Benoit. Revenge with a capital R. It's the best kind of revenge. So now weird bobblehead Chris Benoit is out to uh, talk trash. We're at SummerSlam, the August pay-per-view event. And here we have some of the occasional problems with uh, No Mercy story mode. We have a, a weird story glitch where the game seems to forget who the champion is. Benoit demands that we bring him his belt, the one that he has draped over his shoulder. Olympic hero is not deterred by paid thugs. What is happening with Benoit's hand? And Angle's hand, for that matter. Farouk. F-A-A-R-O-O-Q. Don't ask me who came up with that spelling. So this is a this is gonna be just like the match we we had before this one, except this time Farouk is on our side. Which is going to make things considerably easier, as you would imagine. Though, it's still going to be a little clumsy. Uh, we, we saw some of this in the in the Acolytes match. The teamwork AI is not all that great. And in a handicap match like this, your partner is just as... Uh, just as likely to get in your way than he is to actually help out. This Farouk seems to be doing a pretty good job. We'll let him take the brunt of it for a minute while we do some posing. Build up our attitude meter. See if we can reach into the crowd and get ourselves some weapons. Ah, the ring bell. 
Why a guy in the front row was holding the ring bell, who knows. Oops. Farouk has built up his, his special move, the Dominator. I am more than willing to let him use anytime he feels like it, Farouk. So this this bit with, with Farouk now fighting on our side is an interesting aspect of the APA's characters, that they really were, you know, they weren't good guys or bad guys, they were just sort of, I mean, they were, as, as, as I said last time, they're just thugs for hire. And I'm pretty sure we're done with them in this uh, particular story. As now, surely, surely, we're gonna get our title match now, right? And hey, we 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 paid three hundred dollars to hire Farouk. We made four hundred dollars on the match. That's a hundred dollars profit. We'll save for all the good it'll do me on a no mercy uh, save. Chapter seven. Condition of reconciliation. Those are roughly big words for Monday Night Raw. the Intercontinental title belt, but I have grown very fond of it. That actually does sound like something Chris Benoit would say in a promo. Title shot, but first you must prove yourself. We already beat you. If you recall. Uh, the Demon Kane. Who at this point in 2000 was really just a boogeyman. Uh, this is honestly, this is what Kane gets used for a lot. Kane's character is that he's a big, scary guy, and um, he really—he's—he's like—he's like the WWE's version of a mini boss. Like, you have to beat him in order to prove that you're you're worthy of challenging the actual bad guy. It won't, it won't, shouldn't be too much trouble to beat Kane here. <clears throat> now, Kane has a fascinating backstory. And by fascinating, I mean ludicrous. Uh, Kane, <laughs> uh, the, the wrestler who portrays Kane is named Glenn Jacobs, and he, he got into the WWF in the mid-90s portraying the legendarily awful character Isaac Yankum DDS. He was, uh, as you might guess from the name, an evil dentist. Because, uh, well, the 90s were pretty bad all around for professional wrestling. But that didn't work, as you would expect. So he, he was eventually repackaged in 97 as Kane, and he is The Undertaker's brother. Uh, the Undertaker, of course, the Lord of Darkness, and Creature of the Night and all of that. Kane is his half-brother. Uh, originally his evil brother, but they switched sides very often. So they originally they start feuding, then they were friends, then they feuded, then they were friends, then they feuded, then they were friends. 
I want to say that when this game was made, this was in 2000, I think they were both good guys. I think they were friends at this point. Whoops. Okay, Kane just busted out a drop toll. That, that would never happen. As you would expect from somebody Kane's size, it's not really about the wrestling moves. It's more just a big, just a pick him up, throw him on the ground kind of person. But Kane's, depending on what storylines were happening and who happened to be in charge in the booking committee, uh, Kane's character would go from supernatural undead monster to scary dude in a mask and back and forth and back and forth his uh the quasi supernatural nature of his character has led to uh, or allowed the WWE writers to indulge in their very worst excesses Kane was also the fulcrum of uh, arguably the most tasteless storyline in WWE history. Which, when you think about it, that's saying something. <clears throat> uh, the legendarily awful Katie Vick storyline from 2002. Which reached its peak when Triple H pretended to have sex with a mannequin on camera in a coffin that's a long story I might get around to explaining it in one of these videos but this match is just about over alright not so much for Kane as I said, he's supposed to be a big, bad boogeyman, but he always loses in these matches. <laughs> That's the thing with a uh, mini-boss. <clears throat> so with Kane defeated, rather easily, I would add, we're going to get some more money. $2,000. We'll actually get to spend this money uh, in, in my next little mini-series after... After I get out of the Intercontinental title bracket, I'm going to show you the create a character mode, which is where we'll get to spend some of this cash. So now, surely, we'll get our title shot. Judging by the title of the chapter, I guess that's not going to happen. Now see, look at that. Chris Benoit, stand-up guy. Honesty integrity. I know when I think of the name Chris Benoit, that's the trait that comes to mind. Why did I pick the Intercontinental title? Uh-oh. So now we're joined by Canadian superstar Edge. Edge has decided, based on his awesome hair, he deserves to be the Intercontinental Champion. <laughs> uh, the rules of professional wrestling are weird sometimes. I'd like that to happen in a baseball game. Two teams are about to play Game 7 of the World Series, and... Suddenly the San Diego Padres show up and go, no, wait, I want to play too. But anyway, so now we're in a triple threat match. Now in a triple threat match, it's three people in the ring all at the same time fighting each other, and the first person to score a pinfall or a submission is the winner. It doesn't matter who you beat as long as you beat somebody. And this is our first must-win match. As you see, it shows our continues. We have to win this match in order to for the story to continue. All the others were branching story points. We could have lost 
any of those other matches. And this one's going to be frustrating. Because beating one person to the point of unconsciousness is not good enough. You have to beat one person up to the point where you can pin them. And somehow render the other person incapable of breaking up the pin attempt. I should note this, uh, this match is like a, uh, a neck injury convention. Uh, these three men were notorious for their neck problems. Chris Benoit missed a year uh, from a neck injury in uh, the early 2000s. Edge, uh, who is uh, actually a WWE Hall of Famer. If you didn't know, there is a WWE Hall of Fame. Edge is in it. Uh, at, at this point, he was sort of just like in the just the, the mid card. I, I think he'd won the Intercontinental title once for maybe a month. He was mostly a tag wrestler at this point, but he would go on to be a very, very big part of uh, the WWE in the mid 2000s until he was forced to retire abruptly because of a neck injury. And then Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle is... His life story is uh, a neck injury. He he broke his neck while... Tr wow. That was a punch. Uh, Kurt Angle broke his neck while training for the 1996 Olympics. Uh, and then rather than take the time off from training to let it heal, he instead continued to wrestle with a broken neck and eventually won his gold medal in Atlanta with a broken neck. Uh, this obviously led to neck problems later, and he would frequently miss large, large uh, periods of time with neck injuries. Though true to form, he would always come back about three months faster than everybody expected. Though in, in hindsight, probably would have been better off taking the time off. At some point, I'm not sure when it happened, at some point Chris Benoit got busted open. And I'm not sure when it was. I'm going to go get some weapons. Get ourselves a steel chair. Edge is getting a little bit too... Got a little too much momentum for my taste. And as you'd expect in, in pro wrestling, the chair is the great equalizer. As you can see, a lot of uh, a lot of animations of this game are unbreakable. Once you once you get somebody in an animation for a move, they it's impossible to break it, and they become sort of impervious to any and all contact. Unfortunately, the chair swinging animation is not one of them, so. They can knock it out of my hands. Oh, this isn't good. Thank you, Benoit. I made the mistake of going after Edge when his attitude meter was almost full. If he's, if he's gonna hit his finisher on somebody, I'd much rather it be Chris Benoit. 
which I believe we're about to see the downward spiral from Edge. There it is. We'll break up the pinfall. This is what I mean about these matches being difficult. It's a nice counter. It, it, camera angle didn't really show it off, but it's a nice nice way to counter the German suplex there. My my issue the uh as as, as you can see Benoit now Benoit is ready to use a finisher. It's the problem with using the weapons actually. So they do damage, but they don't really do a lot for your attitude meter. Which is not really going to help me win. But my my issue with the with the blood in this game is that it's it's and I understand, you know, limitations of hardware and everything, but it's very now you see it, now you don't. I'm going to try to... No, it's not going to work. I'm going to try to sneak a pinfall that Edge did not stay down nearly as long as I needed him to. Uh, but the... Uh, yeah, the blood. So the blood... One minute, there's no blood on you. And then you get hit in the face with a sufficiently damaging move. And then... Ah, you're bloody. And then there's a splotch of blood on your face, and it always looks the same, and it's suddenly there, and then that's it. Obviously, in later games, as the hardware improved, you'd actually start bleeding. Oh. Here we go. No. Oh. I thought the weird angle was going to help me out, but... Edge figured it out. It's a German suplex, one of Benoit's signature moves. Nah. Edge out of the ring here. Oh, Benoit can go with him. That's that's fine. I'll just pose. <laughs> Take that, Benoit. I forgot you could do that, actually. I was trying to put the chair down. And I hit the wrong button and threw it at him. As I mentioned before, this is, this is No Mercy life hack number one. Just stay out of the ring and taunt to your heart's content, or throw your opponent out of the ring and taunt to your, taunt to your heart's content. Now this, unfortunately. Ha-ha! It's another one of Benoit's trademark moves, the falling headbutt, which I was smart enough to avoid. Yeah, top rope moves not working for everybody today. Ah. Oh, my goal is here is to keep Edge out of the ring. Benoit has taken by far the most damage. And I want to sort of isolate him. Edge, Edge keeps trying to throw himself off the top rope. That's not going to work. And now Benoit is a little bit too revved up. 
for my taste. Now his rolling German suplexes, which I, be I believe that's his finisher. So we're going to throw Benoit out of the ring. And try to pin... Oh, nope. Couldn't do it fast enough. So now both, both Benoit and Edge have been hit with finishing moves. So I think either one of them might be right for pinfall. If I can just get them away from me. I'll break up the pin. See if I can get Benoit out of the... Nope, that was stupid. See, that's 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 another thing you want to do right there you just want to when in these kind of matches you just want to sort of distract the guy who has a special meter full so he can't actually do his finishing move especially Benoit because Benoit's Benoit's finish his, his forward finish is a fisherman suplex which is an automatic pin attempt so you want to make sure he can't hit that if at all possible An abdominal stretch. It's not a not a not a submission hold you see very often anymore. And now, yes, let us it's a doomsday device. Thank you, Edge. No. Now, Edge has a full meter, which... Oh, boy. Come on, Benoit. Come on, Benoit. Thank you. Now, ugh. That was bad, but at least it was... No, Benoit! <sighs> oh. So now I got hit with a finishing move, and I'm bloodied, and I'm unconscious, and... Oh, thank you, Benoit. I remember, as I said, I don't have to actually get beaten to lose this match. If, if Benoit gets pinned, I lose. redirect button one too many times and ended up facing the wrong way. So we've all been hit with finishing moves now, so it's really any man's game. Ah! What the? It's an inverted suplex. Uh, an inverted vertical suplex from Chris Benoit. Well, they're just posing. Ah, didn't start it soon enough. See, Edge is, Edge is trying to use my own tactic against me. Ah! I thought I was far enough out of the way. 
So this is the thing in, in these these um, these multi-man matches. They don't have sort of the moving camera. Ah. The, uh, the the moving camera that you'd have in a regular singles match because they want to keep everybody on. Sc Ugh. I'm getting destroyed. They want to keep everybody on screen all at once, so they have to zoom out that way. This is not turning out the way I hoped. Oops. Benoit wiped out there on a headbutt attempt, and now I've got like a, a concussion or something. You can tell by my holding my head or neck. Benoit just hit his finisher on the outside. That would be a pinfall if we were in the ring. I'm going to pose as much as possible to try to bring my heat meter back up. The edge is just getting... Um, I don't want to say any of those words. Let's say he's getting beaten on the outside by Benoit. Get Benoit out of the ring. Nope. You get out. Stay down for as long as possible. Alright, pin him quickly. Not quick enough. Okay, here we go. Do I get this? And then it's angle slams for everybody. That's not an angle slam. Nah. Did not work out. The way that I wanted it to. Benoit's again red hot. I don't want to get anywhere near him. He's in this state. Let him do his move and then break it up. Okay, why did I do that? <laughs> it's violating my own strategy. Okay. Benoit. Get him out of the ring. No! I forgot to explain to Edge the plan. Okay. No. Alright, Edge, here we go, here we go. Hit him. Excellent. Alright, small package. One, quickly, two, quickly. Three, yes! <sighs> and this is why I'm glad these matches are so long. Number one, it's realistic quite common for a triple threat match like this to last 16 minutes, but also when you win even on a fluke like that there's a real sense of accomplishment I feel good about myself now, in any kind of sane universe that would be the end of it we would now get our title match and things would be settled but as you know, this is not a sane universe. So we will find out the next complication on our next video, which will be coming up shortly. As uh, next time we will complete, we will end this, and we will once and for all settle things with...
Chris Benoit over the Intercontinental title. So we add $500 more to our total. Uh, so I will see you next time with Chapter 9 and the finale of the Intercontinental title bracket. Thanks for watching.